Christmas is a time for sharing, knowing you've been blessed. Christmas is a time for giving, love is made of this. That's what Christmas is. Christmas is a joyful time, if you're the lucky ones. Some are blessed with gifts and trinkets, others have in mind. Some have feasts upon the table, others having crumbs. There are the haves and the have-nots, and you could be either one. Hello everyone, and welcome to our holiday special. Uh, and I hope that you're all doing good. I'm seeing a lot of uh, people from different countries joining. If you have just joined it and you haven't done it yet, please uh, use the chat to let us know where you are based uh, and say hello for everyone. My name is Rachel. I'm one of the organizers of Data Plus Women, um, co-organizer of the group here in the Netherlands. I forgot to say this, but uh, I'm uh, based in Rotterdam, talking from Rotterdam. Uh, and I'm also the co-organizer for the group, in uh, for the Latin group. So today we are here to commemorate our end of year special that's becoming our little tradition. That's the second time that we have a special in the end of the year. And what we have been doing is using this time to celebrate the groups, to get people from different groups together. Uh, so before we start it and tell you about what is coming in, we have kind of amazing speakers today that will be talking about very, very exciting topics in data. But before we go there, uh, let's just talk a little bit about who we are. Uh, and I don't know, but uh, for everyone that joined us, if you could please tell us if this is your first Data Plus Women, or if you're usual in any of our groups. So is it your first Data Plus Women? Yes or no? And then you can put in the chat. We'll be having a look here just to, to see if we're having a lot of uh, new people or not really. Oh, a lot of uh, people in the, in the first, first timers and lots of non-first timers also. So for everyone that is coming in for the first time, welcome. The ones that have been in other ones and that are attending again, welcome also. It's very nice to see you again. For everyone that is new, so a little bit about the, what Data Plus Women is. We're a network of women in different cities, different countries. Um, and the idea of Data Plus Women is to give visibility to women working in data. For everyone that works in data, it's no news. There are a bunch of guys around. Uh, usually we don't see a lot of uh, female face. I don't know you, but on my case, for instance, at the moment, I think that my team, we are 10 people, my direct team, and I'm the only woman. <laughs> so the, the main idea here is to give visibility to the women that are uh, working in data and showing uh, their, our work, right? What, what, what things we're doing and the companies that we were working for, a little bit to kind of create the space where we can share, we can kind of show that we're also here and also to encourage more women, of course, to come and work in, 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 in this field. That is a very interesting one. Um, also important for our meet meetings, we always start by a little bit of a housekeeping. So everyone knows where to find stuff and everything. We're using Zoom. Um, I think that everyone is familiar with the Zoom at this moment in life, right? We, we were kind of obliged to, to become familiar with Zoom. Um, you see that there is an option, a Q&A Q option that we'll be using. Uh, so if you have questions uh, for the panelists, please use the Q&A. Uh, the chat 
will be here all the time. So feel free to say hi. If you see people that you uh, know from real life, say hello, feel free. The chat is for everyone. It's for interaction. Use it as if you are all together in a space. Uh, and for everyone that uh, likes uh, social media, you can use hashtag data plus women. That is how we find the, the tweets during the event. Uh, so if you'd like to tweet everything that is happening here, feel free. Uh, and of course, this event uh, has been recorded uh, and we will make it available in the end, uh, not in the end of the event. We need a little bit of time because we need to first receive the link and then we will upload. So probably tomorrow or Monday it will be available on YouTube. And for those of you that would like to do a little bit of uh, cooking today, um, in around one hour, Annabelle will be um, sharing, not sharing, she will be showing how to make this recipe. So you can quickly grab everything that is needed. Here are the ingredients. You have one hour to kind of uh, find them in your house. For those of you that have those super quick supermarkets, I don't know, but here we do have one available. I won't kind of say the name because they're not a sponsor, but they deliver in less than 10 minutes. So if you do have one, you're still having time to have the ingredients before Annabelle arrives. And with that said, I will call Eddie to talk about our groups and do a little intro of our groups. Eddie, it's with you. Thank you, Rachel. So for those of you who didn't know, for this event, we, we collected several Data Plus Women groups uh, across Europe and even up to uh, Latin America to bring you this event together because there's many, many Data Plus Women chapters out there in the world and we wanted to introduce you to a couple of them. So if you are in the roundabout London area, you should definitely check out Data Plus Women London led by Tuba, Sarah, Ellie and Ivy. If you are anywhere in the German speaking area, but don't speak German, or at least you understand English, please come to one of our events. So I am one of the co-leads of Data Plus Women Germany, together with my co-lead um, Leah, and you can definitely follow us. Um, from Zurich, uh, we have Annabelle here today, who will be uh, doing the cocktail recipe with you later. So you should definitely grab all those ingredients. Um, and she does a fantastic job of leading Data Plus Women in Zurich together with her co-lead Olivia. In Ireland, we have uh, Louise and Katie who've done a fantastic job of re-energizing the Irish Data Plus Women chapter this year. All right, can we go to the, yeah, thank you. From the Netherlands, uh, we have Rachel here today who just introduced uh, everything before. Um, and she leads Data Plus Women Netherlands together with uh, Aline, Maike and Marise. And if you are in the Romandie area, you may want to reach out to Joanna and Fatima who lead the local Data Plus Women chapter there. From France, we have quite the large team. So we have Selma, Katrina, Sarah, Elisa, Sarah, Marie, and another Marie. Um, so lots of people there who are, I'm sure are doing a great job of leading the French chapter. And in Luxembourg, uh, we have Merve, um, who is uh, leading that local chapter there. And oh yeah, two more. Okay, so <laughs> if you uh, want to reach out to chapters who don't only do sessions in English, you may definitely want to reach out to uh, Rosario, Gabby and Paula if you are interested in sessions uh, in Spanish, or if you are more interested in uh, Portuguese uh, sessions, definitely reach out to Nisa, Rachel and Barbara who lead um, Data Plus Women LATAM together. Oh, thank you, Heidi. Well, as you see, you have many user groups that you can join. If you are interested in forming a new Data Plus Women in your area, if you don't have one, please also reach out. We will help you and support you to do so. So for today, we have a packed agenda. So you already start working on that recipe, but uh, we will have 
the, the keynotes, we have Shelby Wallo from Strava. She will talk about bad data and how that can ruin our business and how can it have dire consequences for all the users. So she will kind of drive us through the life cycle of data and the phases where the bad data can be introduced. So it will be really interesting and it will be really on point of what many things we, we kind of go through on our daily lives. She will also highlight ways to troubleshoot the problems and share common fixes that can allow us to fix bad data problems. That will be extremely helpful. After that, and on the theme of uh, Strava and self-quantifying, we will have a small panel that will be myself, uh, Rachel and Heidi. We will show you some of the visualizations that are already public and Tableau Public with self-quantified uh, visualizations in Tableau Public. And after that, we will have Julia. She will tell us how she went from building sculptures to building dashboards, how she changed her career. As many of us here in the call potentially did it, she will walk us through her journey. And around half five, we will be closing and networking. Hopefully, we already have that recipe that uh, Annabelle will tell us, and that will be between our um, panel and our last speaker, Julia. So you have still that time to do your recipe, to collect all the ingredients, and you can savor that cocktail as we network. So with no further ado, we will start speaking, the, start presenting our speakers. So our first one, as I already said, is Shalvi Waklu. She is the Senior Dire Director of Data at Strava. Shalvi is, she leads the large team of product analysts and machine learning engineers that enable data informed product improvements in support of Strava athletes. In the past, she worked at Salesforce, Fitbit, and multiple other data rich companies, in addition to previously running her own company. As a data leader, she focused on harnessing the power of data to build great products, clarify the strategy, direction, and improve business processes. She is also a passion mentor in the community and spends her spare time volunteering for programs that further STEM education for minorities. So welcome, Shalvi, and I'll pass the, the floor for you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining and welcome to the Data and Women Holiday Special 2021. Thank you to the Tableau user group for hosting me today. My name is Shalvi Vaklu. My keynote today will be a journey to explore bad data. Together, we will understand how to prevent, diagnose, and cure bad data. By the end of the talk, I hope you feel empowered with the right tools to make sure that bad data never gets in the way of great business outcomes. A little bit about me. I go by the she, her pronouns, and these are a few cities where I have lived. I work at Strava, where I am their senior director of data. Strava is the leading social platform for athletes and the largest sports community in the world. We have over 95 million athletes in 195 countries. If you'd like to join our mission, we are hiring. So first, what is bad data? Bad data is any data that is inaccurate, incomplete, or misleading in some way. You can usually notice it when an analyst encounters it because they get really mad that it has shown up and has now potentially ruined their next couple of hours. Maybe days, maybe weeks, I really hope not. Today, we're gonna to discuss what we can do about bad data. We can prevent it, diagnose it, and cure it. I'm gonna spend a bulk of our time today at the prevent stage. Understanding prevention is one of the best ways to get better at also diagnosing and curing it. So let's dive in and understand the prevent stage and see how bad data actually gets introduced. All data goes through a very similar life cycle. First, we define the features and align the different teams on those definitions. Next, we work on logging the data to track and store it. After that, we use some business rules to transform that data into a more usable format. Then, an analyst is able to interpret the data to solve some business problems. 
And finally, the data results are shared with the stakeholders. Now we have identified the data life cycle, and you'll start to see that at each phase, there are numerous possibilities to unintentionally introduce bad data. There is a lot going on in this graphic, but I wanted to show the full picture before I dive into each of the sections. I usually have this graphic pinned somewhere to remind me of all the places where my data might be getting corrupted. Let me jump into each of the sections before I come back to this visual. A lot of my examples today are actually going to be anchored at COVID-19 pandemic. Um, unfortunately, that is still the theme of the world where we're living in right now. But hey, life moves on. We've got vaccines and boosters. So I hope next year we can have some other more fun anchoring. Let's say that you are trying to track COVID cases in a population. You are relying on data filled out per patient by healthcare workers. How do you define those various pieces of data that you want to track? A lot of issues can arise based on how specific or flexible that definition is. So your feature definition may outline that a diagnosis for COVID means that they count as a positive case. But what about people who were asymptomatic and never received a formal diagnosis? They could still tell, test positive for antibodies, which means that they did have the disease at some point. Should those trigger a case flag? Now, COVID is a very widely reported and well-talked about disease so you may end up deciding one way or the other about how to deal with these cases. But it might end up being super inconsistent with the way you think about the caseload criteria for other diseases. And that means you are using uneven logic, which might lead to the creation of bad data. You can also sometimes have a very narrow definition that doesn't include all the scenarios. You pick a definition that fits today's use case and doesn't account for tomorrow. So maybe your use case is only restricted to the current variants and there's something about the other variants that don't catch into that same thing. That those pitfalls that can arise out of that narrow vision also results in you spending extra time fixing it. And sometimes it's just plain old human error. Maybe your definition logic is actually correct, but there's a typo or something else that causes a different disease with a few letters here and there to be picked up in the case statement. These kind of errors are actually, unfortunately, relatively pretty common. Eventually, a bad de definition causes you to miss seeing a clear picture. Your picture may be blurry or oddly cropped out, or just not a picture of what you wanted in the first place. Next is the logging stage, where you actually track the features that you have defined. There's a lot of potential for confusion and inaccuracy at this stage as well. So your tracking itself could be incorrect. Perhaps the engineering team is only logging a subset of the information or is logging the wrong information. You were maybe expecting all COVID, COVID patients to be tracked and instead you are only getting COVID patients who have insurance because you're relying on insurance companies to gather your data. Maybe you're actually logging all cases for patients with or without insurance, but you're just logging them at different places. This will make it really hard for you to reconcile this information later, especially if you don't know that there were some unintended duplicates. For example, people who showed up in both data sets because they didn't realize they were covered by insurance when they first came in for treatment, but eventually they got reimbursed and, and figured it out. So this might not be a very relatable example out, outside of uh, America, but unfortunately, that's a real thing that happens in the US. Or your pipeline itself could be faulty. So maybe there are a few exceptions where it just doesn't track the data. For example, you might have set up the entire tracking to work very well with the mobile app and somebody decides to use the web app or something else. Maybe your pipeline is broken and you don't notice these things. And in some of those cases, you actually have absolutely no way to even retrieve any of that information because it just wasn't, wasn't uh, logged at all in the first place. And another very common problem is timeframe issues. So how long is data being stored for? When does it get aggregated? What time zones are being used? All of those inconsistencies, if there's inconsistencies here, they can cause problems. And ultimately, all in all, if, if there's a broken connection between the data that you want and the data that you're actually tracking, you're gonna end up with a lot of unintended consequences that become hard to reconcile. 
So just like baking, if you take a bunch of rules um, and transform raw ingredients to a finished product, there's a lot of mistakes that can occur along the way. With data, you need to take the raw data and convert it to something usable. Otherwise, every baker will create their own recipe and make a very different product. So the first part of that is making sure the rules are understood. Two human beings looking at a piece of data, they can make very, very different assumptions about what it represents. You see the cake in front of you, but you don't really know what recipe was used and you don't know what ingredients it contains. And so you're just gonna make a guess. So similarly, when someone wants a table, they come looking for a table that contains maybe per data number of COVID cases, unless they actually have more context from before or it's documented somewhere, they don't know whether that table contains new cases, cumulative cases, all current cases, things like that. And they can make very different assumptions based on their prior knowledge. So those assumptions can result in very different uses of the data downstream. And if people don't use the same policies or the same way of labeling data, it can result in a lot of pain later on. Data dictionaries are something that can really, really be very helpful in this regard. So how data is aggregated can also impact how useful it is. If your data is not incrementally aggregated at different steps, then sometimes to resolve a simple issue, you may need to go several steps up in the pipeline. And there's a bunch of transformations that happen after that, which you completely get lost because you don't know the logic for that. So it results in a lot of endless, what I call data gymnastics, which uh, just is a result of not being thoughtful and aligned in the aggregations that might be useful for a specific use case. And finally, logical errors can also occur while transforming. Human error shows up in almost every single part of the life cycle and transformation is no exception. We're on to our fourth stage of the data life cycle, which is analyzing. This is really where the rubber meets the road and you start actively using the data as an input for key decisions. First step is the problem statement itself. Stakeholders and analysts can easily be misaligned on the question that is being attempted to be answered in the first place. That misalignment can lead to assumptions that are expensive to fix once all the analysis has already made significant headway. That rework and resentment that follows can be avoided if there is clarity initially upfront about what is the problem being solved and what do all the nuances mean. Besides that, while analyzing results again, there's a capacity for human error. You may have used the wrong model to solve your problem, or maybe you just made a mistake in your calculations. The last thing to watch for, and this is extremely important, and I won't be able to do this subtopic enough justice due to time, is that there could be biases in your algorithm. Consequences of things that are interpreted the wrong way or there's a bias baked into, baked into what you're trying to do are, can be really significant. And especially insensitive things like when you're trying to figure out healthcare for large groups of people or you're trying to do something else that is sensitive and that affects a lot of people, there's a capacity to really have very negative outcomes. In this, for example, if you have a biased data set to learn about how a disease progresses, it can only include, and maybe you've only included data points from a specific demographic. Your, your published insights in that case can actively cause harm to the underrepresented demographic that was not included in your original data set. And so there are some very, very blatant examples of this in the industry. Um, for example, I always quote this one because it's so egregious that women are still more likely, way more likely to die from a heart attack because their symptoms are different from those of men. And their symptoms were not collected, they were not aggregated, and that basically led to poorer diagnosis. This was a fault of missing data. So there can be so many, there can be so many other things like that. There are differences along race, um, which led unfortunately to black women having a higher pregnancy related mortality rate due to systemic racism that provided them inadequate and inferior care. Here again, the fact that there was a lack of data and research that quantified that problem led to this issue being ignored for decades. 
because black women dying from child during childbirth was just not seen and tracked in aggregate so it was only understood at a very anecdotal level and not given its due importance so i do feel that there is a lot of thoughtfulness required to really make sense of data and to extract the right insights at the analysis stage and to not make an unintentional error lots of folks maybe they just um are tempted to treat an incidence of breast cancer in men as bad data and remove it from analysis. But depending on the situation, even though men have it at low, low rates, it may still be relevant to your analysis. Maybe you're throwing out useful data for transgender patients who are also historically underrepresented in optimized healthcare outcomes that serve their unique needs. And now for a little bit of lightness, um, on to the final stage of the data life cycle, sharing it. So first, I'll, I'll draw your attention to this graph, it's, uh, to this chart. It's, it's one of my favorite examples of a really bad visualization. So there's a, there's, a, there's a pie chart going on, and it doesn't actually add up to 178%, or it, it adds up to 178%, which is, well, not possible. Um, so I won't even get into the colors and, or, or the terrible labels. And this was unfortunately broadcast on ABC and its main purpose seems to have been to make people laugh, which is, which is, which is good because we all need that. So sharing data is unfortunately often where a lot of inaccuracies and misrepresentation can show up because when you're sharing data, you are telling a story. If your story has flaws, it's not going to be impactful. Faulty reporting includes data results that are constructed incorrectly or have typos. In such cases, it starts a whole cycle since that same faulty data might spur further analysis that is also inaccurate. This could be in the form of reports, data stories, or visualizations. A good practice is generally to remove any data being shared and that doesn't have an active owner. This community, of course, is People are very active on Tableau. There's a lot of resources. There's a lot of good, uh, good best practices about the visualization and the data storytelling piece, I think, in this community itself. Next thing to worry about is misinterpreted results. So when COVID data was shared initially, I saw lots of examples of charts and publications and online by very, very reputable sources that really just didn't even take the extra five minutes to clearly label their charts missing keys, labels that are listed inside a paragraph next to the, instead of right next to the chart, or just things that people assumed would be true about the data, but the caveat was actually hidden away somewhere in a tiny text. There was also a lot of cases of things being sensationalized where the raw numbers look terrible until you normalized it by population size or some other factors. Such misrepresentations can have very dire consequences, especially at the policy level of countries and policymakers trying to um, trying to react to misinformation and focusing on things that are just not the highest priority. Finally, a common problem at this stage is one that when you give people access to some data, they are free to use it in other analyses. Some of the use cases really might not be in line with what the data truly represents and what it was meant to be included for. You can't always stop people from doing that, though what you can do is you can at least be thorough about the nuances of the data and have some documentation upfront that helps people understand any potential downstream use cases um, and what, what something can and cannot be used for. And that rep, wraps up our prevent stage. Once again, remember to keep in mind the various ways that it is common to introduce bad data. This is by no means meant to be an exhaustive list. It is rather a mind prompt to help folks easily identify the very various things to keep in mind. Hopefully once you understand how bad data gets created, it becomes a little bit easier to diagnose it and understand what's going on. So there are some very common ways that people take notice of bad data. Usually data has some source of truth or just um, something you trust a lot. A lot of us have our trusty Tableau dashboards where we, where we go for information and we see it in a bunch of places and it just doesn't match. There's, there's, there's you know, there's uh, some, either an absolute or an aggregation. There's something that looks off. Other times you see a data result and it just doesn't make sense. It's not logical. You, 
may sometimes think that actually this is the this is the right answer my other one was the wrong answer but it still warrants an investigation because it it doesn't make sense from what you understand uh, to be true about the data so either way the first step is to always look for the obvious reasons why you're encountering or suspecting bad data first obvious question is is this really bad data were the two numbers that you were thinking should match actually supposed to match or did they actually represent different things and the suspicious results what assumptions have led you to have those suspicions and then look at your data set was it even built for your use case or are you just looking for the right answer but in the wrong places and finally is there some known bug or pipeline issue which maybe signifies uh, a known issue that the, there's a temporary thing that has a fix or you can fix it that you can dive into. So if none of those obvious reasons are the answer, then I recommend being very methodical and going step by step to find the root cause. So here what I like to do is I like to start with the data lifecycle, but in the reverse order. So for each phase, verify if the phase before it has the right data. This will help you identify exactly where something is breaking. And when you find the phase where the data is breaking, go through that common root cause examples and create a hypothesis about what might be happening. Hypothesize, test, and validate, and keep repeating that process until you find something that explains your issues fully. So final sanity check is to just logically go through your problem, document what you know and what you need to figure out. I go for the journalist favorite questions of trying to document a story. Focus on the what, where, when, why, who, and how of the problem. As I go through this, it helps to rope in other people to walk through my logic or even look up data dictionaries and other documentation to validate my initial assumptions. The truth is out there. You just have to keep breaking down the problem until you find the specific issue. Once you diagnose bad data, uh, curing it is a lot more straightforward. When you have correctly identified the problem, the solution is usually straightforward. The diagnosis will tell you where the problem lies and it isn't always going to be in your hands to fix it. Data lifecycle has many parts and any of those parts could have an issue that has multiple owners, all of whom would need to come together to fix it. But you can help push that process along by explaining the what, why, who, how, when, <laughs> etc. Also, do keep in mind that you can't always, unfortunately, fix things that occurred, an issue that occurred in the past. Sometimes something that broke causes a permanent and unfixable gap. However, you can cure the problem for the future and add guardrails in place to flag issues going forward. For the data folks in the audience, here are some of the most basic scripts that you can write to fix issues faster, which can result in less data corruption. The more familiar you are with your data and its most common problems, the easier it is to write common scripts or even make visualizations that make it really easy to quickly pinpoint and fix problems. I often have visualizations in place for my most common areas where I really want to make sure that nothing goes wrong, all the data, all the broken down by dimensions, so I can quickly pinpoint it. So most, most, uh, most basic thing is just a basic volume check. Um, different sources, are you, are you getting, are you seeing inconsistencies in the rows of data or is there something else that's causing it? Just having that, those spot checks with volume can be a very, very good starting point. Then um, things that help you quickly identify where data is either missing or that data is duplicate. So writing a quick script to do that can also be really helpful for you to quickly narrow down what it is that you need to fix. And finally, just being able to break the data down by different dimensions, as I mentioned earlier, it can really be helpful, especially because when the data is really large, small volume changes just aren't noticeable. So you may realize that in general, your data looks fine, but there's just like this one specific piece, like one whole disease area is missing or, uh, you know, back to our, the, our COVID example, and uh, maybe there's a typo or, 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 or something else that is breaking in terms of the automation that you were trying to do. So some coding practices that can help you stay consistent. Always, always, always reduce your work and create reusable modules. 
you will thank your past self when you're on a time crunch and need to check a bunch of things in a short amount of time. Having those snippets of code already ready to go that can easily be dynamically changed. And the same thing is true for visualizations as well. Have your visualization ready and just make it so that you can plug in different sources and get to the same information in a short amount of time. So document well and centralize your code as well as your visualizations to make sure that it is accessible across your teams, which helps build consistency. And finally, add alerts to your pipeline or just anywhere where you can identify that, hey, something is off. Um, you expect these normal thresholds. It's not meeting it. Maybe it's in the form of a visualization where you see that, OK, this is below this limit. That means I should launch an investigation. So last reminder, prevention is always better than cure. There is a more detailed data lifecycle checklist that can help look at each phase and find ways of preventing bad data. And there are also some simple generalized strategies that I have listed here that can help early on. So reconcile your terminologies, make sure everyone in your company is speaking the same language, automate everything and simplify all the stuff that you can whenever possible. Um, I will also am a heavy advocate for creating a governance strategy early on so it can save you headache at a later stage. And finally, at regular intervals, do an audit and figure out what strategies and processes are working for you. Have a way for folks in your team to flag inconsistencies or just highlight anything that is broken. And with that, I wanted to leave you with some additional research and reference material. I also have more specific coding examples in. Um, some of my other other talks, which is linked on my website. And with that, thank you all so much for attending today's keynote. I really hope you found the content useful. If you'd like to connect with me, I'm very active on Twitter and you can find a bunch of additional ways of getting in touch with me through my website, shelby.com. I put out a lot of free content and offer member mentorship to women in tech, folks who are new engineering managers, and just anyone who's looking for some guidance in the tech uh, and data world. Lastly, I am really, really grateful to the Data and Women Tableau user group for organizing this wonderful event and for hosting me virtually. This is such a fantastic community of very, very dedicated folks, and I'm really glad to be a part of this. I hope you all enjoy the rest of the amazing content today and build connections with other folks in the industry. Thank you all and have a great, amazing day. Thank you, Shelby. We have some questions on the Q&A, so I will start with the first one, which is, how can we fix bad historical data? Oh, great question. Um, thanks. And, uh, you know, time, time machines are helpful if someone invents them. Uh, but if not, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it uh, boils down to what was wrong with the data in the first place. So like I said, there are some things that are just not possible in the past. Like if you if you just didn't log the data at all, like it is it is really hard to hard to go back and do that. But if the if if the error was actually in the transformation or in sort of the analysis stage or sharing stage, like that is something where you can go back, um, go back and edit those those rules um, so that it shows up so that, so that it shows up correctly and it's at least fixed for the future. Um, but yeah, if, if if the data just went missing, um, unfortunately, there's no, no real way to retrieve it. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, the other one that uh, we have, we have a, a next question, and it's talking about predictive analytics, which is a common uh, subject at the moment, and what to check to make sure we aren't basing predictions in bad data. What are your uh top tips? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a really, really, really thoughtful question as well. And I think, um, you know, with with uh, with those things, we always have to go back to why are we trying to predict something and what can people possibly do with that information. And I think that 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 answer should be sort of guiding us in in how much thoughtfulness we put we put into the problem because. Um, based on what decisions people can possibly take with that prediction that you make, um, the consequences can be really, really sort of important. So I think the standard rules are have have a have a have a data set that actually represents diversity. It's not it's not restricted to something um, and like really actively try to 
think like a um, you know think like a coder like coders often do this thing where they're trying to almost break their code it's like assume bad actors assume um sort of faulty ways of people not doing it so you know um <laughs> maybe get your grandma to like see like hmm, how would how 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 would how would grandma possibly break this code and again uh, you know uh, grandmas can be really smart uh, but it's 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 more about like who is unfamiliar with the with the problem um, where assumptions that you make just might not be true for someone else who's using it. So I think thinking about that, like what is what are all the ways that this can go wrong and what are ways that I can proactively try to address it. And I would also add that um, get active, active feedback in how your predictive model is actually working. Like this is not a set it or forget it that you tested it once and just rolled it out, um, but actually have checkpoints that see your model's performance over time and see if that is changing um, because as you get more use cases as your number of users who are growing it uh, using it grows you might start noticing that there's these little patterns that come up which which uh, need to be addressed in the future so it's more or less coming out of the 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 concept that the data that you have don't take it as granted that is all fine and all good always come out of the the, the idea that the data needs still to be reevaluated, right? Mm -hmm. And the one last question, because you mentioned the what, the how, uh, I wanted to ask you if you have any technique when you are having your requirements gatherings, if you use like design thinking, do you have any tip for, for our audience? Yeah, that's a that's a good question as well. I think um, it's a it's a very interesting thing that I think even for me, like as I get comfortable working with certain stakeholders, I almost default into like I know what they mean. I I you know I I work with them long enough that I that I know about it. But but I think you know even I have to remind myself that always like checking assumptions early and like really spending that time upfront. You know as the as the architects say, like draw it out up front and draw the minutest of details um, so that you actually are sure that everybody is looking at the same piece of information. I think it's I think it saves a lot of time. Like it seems like work up front. Um, and, and, and I do this with the, you know, the what, when, who, how that um, just just making sure everybody's everybody's thinking about it in the same way, because there can be so many tiny nuances that one person has in their head and it just doesn't translate over as easily when 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 someone else is um, talking about it. For sure. So with that, that was our last question. But please, if you are, if you still have questions, put it on the Q&A &A, or we will send uh, an email after the event. You can always reach out directly to Shovia or you can just send us the questions to us and then we relate to the show. Thank you so much. And I Thank hope you. you still stay with us for our chocolate cocktail. <laughs> I'm sure it will be delicious. <laughs> and now we will go, let me just share my screen. And I hope everyone can see. So now is the part that we will go for the panel and we'll be talking about self-quantified analysis. We, we learn a lot of what is bad data, how it can be biased. Normally we talk about that, on big settings because it's where we are working. But when we are collecting data, how can we bring those uh, pieces of knowledge or these nudges, the gold nudges that we learned today to our uh, self-quantified? And within this panel, we will talk about three main subjects. So we will have the self-quantification during quarantine because as we went to quarantine, I think there isn't much that we could do outside of our houses. So I think there was a help for us to start quantifying how much we slept, how much we ate, how much uh, meetings we had via Zoom or Microsoft. We also start getting new habits, maybe running more, doing a little bit more sport. And we start also looking at our CVs. So because we had time to upskill maybe, Surely there was a lot of people making bread. <laughs> so I don't know, it's not a, a skill to put on our CVs. But let's look at these top three categories and let's talk and see what do you think about the visualizations? And Heidi and Rachel will join me on the conversation. And if you have any input, please share with you uh, with us too. So to start, we will start then with the quarantine. 
visualization. So my first three that I chose, they are very simplistic, but they were quite rich in the, the content that they were showcasing. So the first one from Maria, it's a self-analysis where she is analyzing for the months of quarantine, her terms of anxiety, the social media interactions, and the time with friends. What particularly was, uh, I loved about this visualization is because it's very simple. It's uh, following best practices on communication of data. We can see straight away the, the timelines. And we can see the three topics that she is kind of monitoring through the time frame. Let me just pass this to the, the real tableau so we can see a little bit bigger. But tell me, Rachel, what do you think about this uh, self analysis from Maria? Uh, I, I like, especially that it's quite clean. It's like a very kind of a simple design not a bunch of colors it's quite interesting that uh it's yeah the, the simplicity of it is something quite 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 interesting i like it yeah heidi yeah i especially like um like the oh I, I, I almost want to say bland colors because i think that's what everyone felt during quarantine right just staring <laughs> at the same four walls all the time so the fact that it's basically a monochrome I really love that here um, and also that she highlighted certain elements or like points in time throughout her analysis. I, I really like that. It's very neatly done. Yeah, that was another point that I really loved. She didn't use color to highlight the points that she wanted to, to showcase where it was going up or down, but using that dual axis just to, to have that uh, extra information in a very simplistic and minimalistic way, which uh, it's can you can really lift and shift for a business dashboard if needed be. But that was the, the, the highlight for me on this visualization. And she even added a little bit more of the reading. The other thing that I think is quite good to, to talk about is how she says who designed it, of course, and where the data comes from, even if it is her own data. She put the source of the data, which is, again, is a best practice. Any other comments on this from the, the audience or from Rachel, Heidi? No? Let's see the next one. Let's see the next one. This is so exciting. This is like Christmas, right? You couldn't <laughs> be on the back. <laughs> so on this one is Dear Diary. What uh, I loved was, again, it's a, as a timeline. You go from week one to week four. But the technique here that uh, Julia used was using the color and the shapes. So the way that she, she used the, the quantification of how if she was feeling positive, if the week was positive, ne negative, or neutral, was using three different shapes and even the size. So you will go quite quickly, you can go through it and see which week had the most positive dots, which are the blue, which week had the most reds, which is the negative, and which weeks had the neutral aspect of it. And with that, she added also how she felt. So again, for me, very neat. The, it, even the font is very clear, very simplistic and on point. But ladies, please tell me your opinions on this one. I quite like the use of shapes. I think that it's an interesting, uh, uh, interesting use case to kind of add shapes makes it a bit of a, yeah. And, and it reminds a bit when you're kind of uh, drawing stuff in your diary, you know, when you're kind of doing some drawing in your diary. And that it's, it's interesting. Yeah, that emotional point, isn't it? When you put your pen too long on one, you don't know what will write yeah. and create that shape <laughs> of a dent of the ink. And Heidi? Yeah, personally, I like that she that she used like a different version of creating a timeline. So not the usual, let's take a line chart or area chart or bar chart or something, but that he, she instead put it into different panels. 
Um, I think this would not have worked as well if we had more than four weeks, but this way we can see them all in one slot, so that's nice. Precisely. Of course, this wouldn't be something that on a business setting you will kind of use because you will need a lot of explanation of what the dots meant when you present that. But uh, I thought it was original and striking when you look at the first glance, it is quite a striking visualization. So with that, we'll go to another one, which is Netflix. I'm sure everyone had a little bit of a peak of Netflix on our lives since <laughs> quarantine. And this is very interesting from Fred Frederica. She is just using April, March and April, 2020, but she uses the family itself and quantifies who was more binge watching Netflix. <laughs> so this could be good conversations at home. But the interesting part also is she tells you what she thinks about the series or the movies she watch. So you can use this, I'm sorry. So the, the server is just thinking a little bit. She'll give you a little bit of information to the site. She even rates it that for us. So if it is the case that you didn't watch the series of the movie, you can get that information from her visualization, which again is exploratory. It's a different way of uh, showcasing. But Rachel, tell me, what is appealing here? Do you think? What, what is the, the, the color in the bar charts? I like this kind of a yellowish in the, in the, in the, the background. Back. What is it? Yeah. This is just to highlight the highest point. So 3rd of April. Uh, and can I if you filter it filters? Let me double check with questions. To exploratory or... behavior. It does. Ah. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> Magic. I like it. <laughs> I think that I use it to kind of uh, uh, check what I'm watching because I'm a horrible decider. I open Netflix and then I get lost in all the options and it makes me feel very, very bad. It's like, oh, come on. It takes, it takes me one hour to decide what I'm watching next. Then it's not time to watch anything anymore. <laughs> I can use it <laughs> to organize myself. Especially when you are with family, right? You are the one that are just flickering through the films. <laughs> oh, it's a lot of responsibility. I, I never get it, this responsibility. Like, oh, you decided, no, I'm not doing it. No, no, not me. <laughs> yeah, oh, I did. quite like that. Yeah, I always calculate in the time that it takes us to decide on a movie, like on top of the time it takes us to actually watch the movie to decide whether we are watching a movie or a series. Um, but so yeah, <laughs> I, I get that. Um, no, I, I like that that we even have like the pictures of the different um, elements in here. So for the series or movies, um, so that's a nice bit of work um, and yeah, fun to engage with. Sure, and uh, we couldn't be talking with a data person when it says oh, I'm quantifying how long do I, <laughs> I spend trying to choose a movie on top of the, the length of the movie. Could it be more, <laughs> more data driven? So the, the next one that I chose, which I thought is also an interest, uh, interesting way of visualizing, which is that stream chart. I think here we notice uh, experimentation on chart and put, potentially trying new ways of visual, visualizing data. But uh, to me, what was really kind of um, insightful was the amount of uh, sleep deprived Azure had since the COVID, since the quarantine. And apologies, I clicked and Tableau reacted pretty quickly. But I do love how straight away you can see how the work time is completely different after quarantine. You see that is much more planned before, of course, nine to five. And after quarantine is all a bit all over the place. Yeah. Uh, as it is the ingestions of family time during your day, daily time of work normally, which makes you think many families had to so pot potentially being a teacher for the kids or having that uh, extra family time that they wouldn't have normally on a, a day of work. 
Rachel, you are very concentrated. Tell me what you are thinking there. I uh, am yeah, with uh, uh, one is the is live the private part. And the other is there's a lot of entertainment at midnight. The person is not sleeping at all. I'm very worried. I, <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot of non-sleeping during the sleeping time. Uh, yeah, but I can recognize myself not with the non-sleeping at midnight because I was forcing myself to go to bed. But I, and well, I I think that we're depending on the country. We're back in the quarantine mode, or we've never left the quarantine mode. And yeah, I, I feel that if, if I try to visualize my, my day, it, it, it will probably be so mixed at that moment that it will not even be possible to see it anymore. You know, it will be just a <laughs> of everything, like compact everything, put together, mix, 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 mix. I don't know if it would make much sense. I quite like this one. I'd like to try it on myself and see and see how ugly my day is at moments. I wouldn't like to face my reality, but I, I quite like the the idea of uh, stretching the the out, visualizing the the activities together and uh, in this kind of a funky timeline. It's it's interesting. I like it. Yeah, I especially like how you can see well. What, what she highlighted here is how, how work hours got distributed over the day, but I especially like seeing how family time just moved across the whole day. So before it was just after work and until bedtime, and now it's from morning until 2 a.m. Um, so seeing visualized distress that this quarantine mode has put on families especially is very jarring for me as a person without a child. Um, so I think that's that, sh that really shows the impact, like the extra amount of stress that families had to endure this year. So big kudos to everyone in the audience today who has managed to hold their kids through homeschooling and everything. Yeah, that, yeah, that was something that I also noticed is almost like having two jobs post quarantine that you are juggling. So yeah, big kudos for someone, for the people that have kids and had to go through it and we're still going through it but yeah so let me just so this one was more on a curiosity it's very colorful but I did love the way that uh, it was organized like a normal organizer will have her diary with a, a small calendar where you can even see through the days what you had planned and tablo isn't kind of playing with me today okay <laughs> so we can see what was planned through the may 2020 i love that there was little details like grandpa's birthdays and visconnect <laughs> so a little bit of the upskilling in the middle of the visualization but again netflix is a common theme through the quarantine for all of us and again another technique which was using the images on the bar chart. Of course, business setting, potentially you wouldn't use this, but the idea of going through the book and the organizer itself, I think it was quite nice from Madeline. I'm Rachel, still crying please. over the, the canceled <laughs> wedding that we saw on the calendar, and I, yeah. I hope it wasn't Madalena's wedding. Um, and if so, <laughs> my condolences to her. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. And um, with this, I will finalize the part of the quarantine and we'll go now to Rachel because she has the sports part. So let's see how people have been quantifying their sports activities. I'll stop sharing. Rachel, off to you. Okay. So let me share my screen now. And we will start with the page from someone that is here with us today that this bit is from Annabelle and she was quantifying sports. Um, so if we go, this is the, the uh, Tableau public version. And what she decided is to represent uh, the activities as a zero flower, as a dandelion. So if you go here, each one of those zero parts is uh basically the 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 activity happening the, the activities being grouped together uh and i found it interesting because you can explore here or you can explore here also 
if you would like to kind of get more details. So you can open here and for instance, discover who is the favorite instructor of Annabelle on, I think that it's Peloton. Yeah, it's Peloton. So I'm not a Peloton person, as you can see, I have a bike here at the back of Amazon Swifter. Uh, but uh, if you're a Peloton person, then you can let us know if you agree with uh, Annabelle, if this is a good, a good trainer or not. So yeah, that, that was an interesting way. Uh, I think that it's, it's nice to see uh, the activities in a different way than the normal that would be, yeah, the bar and everything. Um, yeah, and, and what do you think, Lisa? Yeah, I love- Lisa is a pelotoner, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do love the visualization. It's not because Annabelle is here, but um, <laughs> I do. I do love that it's simple again. It's very sleek. Everything was done with Tableau, so nothing of Figma that we see a lot of there. So all of those little calculations that she did, but she she managed to keep it very insightful. The annotations also giving a little bit more on the storytelling. I think is always important. And again, there are points that we can really lift and shift for a business dashboard. I, I know that I'm always talking about the business dashboard, but ultimately when we are practicing and the, even on the self-quantified, we are taking those techniques to the business itself. So yeah, love the visualization. Well done, Annabelle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thank I you. especially like the, the button that lets us show like the, the standard charts, because I mean, while I love the uh, the Dandelion chart, I always find myself struggling with like these complex new artsy chart types that also take like heaps of uh, probably data prep. Um, so I think this one strikes a really great balance between like the, the artistical value, but also the analytical value. Yeah, I agree. I think that it's kind of a nice one and you can, you can choose if you'd like or not to, to show it, right? So my second one, the second one that I got is uh, the second and third. Uh, this one, I really like it because of the, it's like you can print it as a poster. And I will tell the truth, I'm like planning to analyze my own Strava data from 2021. And I really would like to make it look like something like, you know, one poster or something like this. And this one is pretty nice, basically. Uh, this is from Agatha and what she did is she created this kind of a, a sample that each one is one of the hikings uh, that she did uh, and it's after da, 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 yeah all the hikes that she did after becoming a parent so uh, you have the the zero uh, stamp so each each square is one of the hikes and you can see here, for instance, the elements, each one of the elements means something. So this, if you go here, this is the length. So you see that it changed. Uh, on top, you have the, the season of the, of the year that she did it. It's quite interesting. Uh, you have the colors are the state where she was. Um, if there is this yellow line, it's because she did it more than nuns. So yeah, I found it quite, quite nice. It's kind of a beautiful, beautiful. I can even put it, let me just put it smaller and then we can see more. Yeah, so this this is the, the hair of this. So Nisa? Yeah, I agree. It's just beautiful. It has loads of information, but you don't feel overwhelmed. And each one of them, it looks really like those small stamps if you are on scouts that you win as you are doing it. I think the idea was that, but uh, I love the design. I love how informative it is. And again, I think it's extremely well done. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the legend in here because it actually like explains every tiny bit. And like as a creator, I think that's also important to, to make the audience understand what kind of lengths you went to and what kind of thoughts you put into this. And I think it's a really nice combination of exploring every walk by itself, but also seeing like the comparison over all the different walks. So nicely done. Yeah, it's very, very nice, beautiful one. 
Uh, next one, it says also, I got it by the simplicity. Basically, Karen put all her run-ins and she's updating. Look, 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 it's quite updated. And this is for this year. So it's still uh, with a good update. Uh, so it's a calendar where you can see all the days that she was active. So you have here, uh, if you hover over, then you have here the information about what the activity is, uh, the distance, average speed, max speed, everything. But it's a very uh, interesting way to have this kind of a overview of uh, all the days that you did something during the year. And then you have here also the summary, big numbers on top. And it's kind of a very clean, easy way to visualize your, your full activity during the year. It's an interesting one. Yeah, uh, for sure. It, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a way of uh, showcasing a lot of information in one view. And having the calendar, everyone relates to, to a calendar. So I do like how the things were done and you can see exactly which were the days that you did more. So you run more than the other days. So it's quite easy to get to the information that you, you really want to get, which will be, if we translate that to business again, it will be the days that potentially you want to, to pay more attention for one reason or another. Or another. So Heidi? Now I've got to find out what happened on April 8th like a big black bar oh what? yeah i forgot to, to show this it's uh, a birthday activity uh, she did oh. the kind of a special uh run nice okay. it's kind of a long very long one during her birthday it's interesting but there, there you go see exactly what uh, we were mentioning before heidi first thing was what happened on the eighth because that is yeah. so much different from everything else. And uh, that is a good way of uh, kind of showcasing the, the insights you, you get on your analysis. Uh, and, really, it's, and, and it's a very active person during the winter. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and my last one, in reality, it's not a, a this, it's a tip, but uh, it's because I know that a uh, lot of people here use Tableau um and we are without the supported uh strava connector it, which doesn't mean that there is no web connector to strava at the moment um there is one it's this one and i've been testing it's working it's fine you can use this so i will share on the on the chat if anyone would like to kind of analyze your own data especially for those that are strava users um feel free i'm planning and i've been it's been fun because i'm planning to visualize my own so uh seeing the other people the way that they visualize it's quite quite interesting it's a lot of yeah you get a lot of inspiration so that was the sports part uh now let's go to cvs okay so i prepared a little something here um if you are interested in looking at CVs, Tableau even has its own gallery for interactive resumes uh, where you have uh, learning resources. Um, you can check out what other people did, which we will be doing shortly. And at the very bottom, um, we even have links to a webinar and a blog post that helps you do your own. Um, so this last part of our panel discussion helps us strike the balance between um, doing fun, analyses about yourself while also combining it with like a business use case in a way. Um, so we'll be looking at Anne Jackson's resume. And what I personally love about Anne's style is that she's always very clean, very muted with one signal color. And we can see that here with the, with the bright teal color. Um, and I, I like that she has combined both long-term like long long stretches of time in this Gantt chart where we can see, okay, what did you do at different points in time while also having these um, singular events in this dot plot at the bottom. So that's something I really like. And I also like that she had these um, analyses where we use like length or location to check out, okay, what is her 
her skill level in here, but instead of labeling it with numbers, she put either mastery or expert or advanced in here, uh, which, which I think is a, is a great way of, of doing this. What are your opinions, ladies? Yeah, I agree. I love and uh, style. Again, simplest, minimalist, and at the same time, interesting by using the different types of charts. You don't see the CV as just a combination of bar charts. Although you could do it, you could kind of translate all the information in bar charts, but by using different charts, you, you make it more interesting and more inviting to, to kind of get all that information. Yeah, like it's really, really good. Rachel? The, the part with the uh, professional proficiency also, it's quite easy to read if you use it this way. And it's because let's be realistic, CVs are really tiring. And everyone that has done, for instance, if you need to interview people and if you need to go through a bunch of CVs, it's, <laughs> it's hell, right? All those kind of uh, lots of uh, words and pages and people describing themselves and yeah, I think that it's it's quite good because it's a bit ref it's a bit of a refresh. You can kind of uh, get the main points much easier than if you go to a, a real, a normal, traditional, regular CV. So quite like it. It's, it's nice, and the colors are beautiful. I love the colors that she's using. I think that they're amazing. I, I like the uh, white backgrounds. I know that in the community there are, there is this kind of a trend in of the black backgrounds, but I, I really find beautiful when you have white backgrounds with uh, light colors. I find them simple, easy to look at. It's beautiful, like it. Yeah, and to show a completely different example. So this one shows, shows a CV of someone who's had a long, productive, successful professional career. Like we're looking at 15 years of experience here, right? Um, so I wanted to show something that you can do when you haven't had that kind of experience. So like, how do you set out with an impressive CV when you've only just begun your career? Um, so let's look at another example from um, Maria Brock. So we already saw one of her examples earlier. Um, and she basically the only thing of, let's say, let's call relevant professional experience that she has in here is as a data analytics intern. And that's it. But still, we have a full page of, of interesting things that we can learn about Maria. So, for example, we can check out um, her, her uh, academical journey um, and we can even see like the different uh, subjects she, she took. So she went um, to the effort of actually um, describing every single skill she learned in here um, so that we can check that out. Um, and even for this one position that she had, we can check out what did she learn in that position? Like, how is this relevant to everything she will be doing after? Um, and this is what I really love in here, that it's sure it, it's beautiful and super informative, informative at the first glance, but every item in here has a lengthy description of how this brings value to whatever kind of um, job she's interested in. So I really love that here. Yeah, I agree. I, I love the way that she used the design. So the shape around her photo is the same shape she is using in her timeline. So that repetition is almost kind of the connection of the two points. Also, she doesn't have much years of experience, but just her CV is showcasing techniques that is already a showcase of Tableau techniques, at the very least. So that is a clever way also to, to integrate that on her CV. And love the color scheme, that uh, it goes well together and it isn't too strong, so it doesn't become distracted. And even having all those uh, information behind the hovering, it also helps for someone that isn't uh, that doesn't know Tableau, doesn't know much how to use it, but just the, the action of hovering and having more information is a really good touch. Yeah, I, I quite like the the thing that looks like uh, the chemistry uh, symbol. I think that the, the way that she put it in the in her photo and the column on the right side, 
it's quite quite interesting especially because that's her area so it's it's kind of a an interesting news of something related to the area she's working in uh, and bringing it to to the as a visual as a visual element it's, it's quite interesting the molecules right the atoms all together exactly yeah it's like the Okay. I'm, I'm, I was a very bad at, at the chemistry classes. Sorry, I forgot. I tried to remember <laughs> the name in Portuguese to then do the translation, and it's not coming, not even in Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> Molecules. Yeah. Okay, and one one last example because um, I mean, part of being a woman is we we often um, don't uh, don't highlight our own work enough. Um, so to counteract that, here's here's mine. Um, you can see some familiar elements probably from the other um, charts because I I heavily um, I don't want to say stole but I heavily used uh, Anne's viz in particular as inspiration so we can some see some elements of that in here we we have these bar charts she used these kind of dot plots to show um, skill levels in different elements. Um, we can see these contact information, which we also had on Maria's chart. So um, that's always relevant to keep in here. Um, and we can also see the kind of dot plot that we had similar in Anne's viz. What I added in here was I wanted to highlight things that are important to me. So first of all, I love traveling. So showing how all these um, different places uh, relate to my life was important to me and also I really love presenting, so having all my different um, presentations in here, for example, the tip battle I did with Annabelle last year for my birthday and having some information about that, once Tableau allows me to load it, uh, was something that I really wanted to incorporate here. So any, uh, any of these sessions that we have, we can see, okay, uh, what, is, what is a description of that? Um, and also like when was it? So this will highlight um, the dot plot as well. And because I'm super indecisive, which I already talked about for Netflix, I couldn't decide on a photo. So I just used two because if you click on this little speech bubble, the photo changes and you can see a brief description about myself as a person. So just a little piece in here. <laughs> uh, love that. Again, Heidi, uh, color schemes. You kept it really simple, highlighting using the that pink reddish just to highlight the most important parts or the parts that you wanted to really highlight. Love how you used the division between the, the areas. So use that uh, the gray backgrounds and then the white as a box just to separate the items. And again, the techniques. So you use so many techniques that we know straight away that you are not starting with Tableau. So all of those things, the, those uh, items do help to your CV to stand out. The other thing I wanted to ask you on the presentations, do you have the video of the presentation? Sometimes. So <laughs> you can, yeah, there's, there's not just the description item. We also sometimes have these like video items. So this will lead us to YouTube so that you can check out the presentation for yourself. Um, and sorry, this line is on top of my screen so I can't change uh, sheets. We can also jump to a blog post if I have one. So for example, if you're interested in community work, um, then you can jump to the related blog post to check out what I'm actually talking about in my talk. Perfect. Yeah, that is another another little gold nugget that you have there, I think. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's a very nice use of the uh, URL actions, I think, to organize the uh, yeah, organize the content and create the link where the person can from the observation directly access it and have the kind of a hero library of everything. I quite like it. Um, and yeah, and the thing that uh, Lisa mentioned, uh, the it's especially for people using Tableau because sometimes we don't explore it uh, with the amount of um, I think that amount of uh, interest that we should, but uh, the thing that you can have different colors in the worksheet and, and in the background, it's quite nice because it can make 
you can very easily create those blocks of content that make it easier to understand which part is which. And it's super easy to create a tableau. It's something like you just change the color of the background and then make sure that your worksheets are kind of a uniform in color. Uh, and it creates a very interesting effect. I, I, at least I, I quite like it. It's something that uh, I personally, I use it a lot. The change, this zero change in the background uh, contrasting with the, the worksheet. But nice one, Ni nicely done, Heidi. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so again, what helped me the most was checking out the webinar and the blog post. So if you are interested in doing that, I will put the link um, into the chat in a second. And the other thing that is uh, quite nice to highlight, so on uh, Heidi's CV, if you look, sorry, Heidi, can you, you show yes, this again? Yes, of course, absolutely, sorry. So for our audience to, to think is, if you don't think that as a CV, you could use that template really for a business dashboard, because quite easily you could put your KPIs on the top and the charts on those little areas that Heidi has there. And even the color schemes that we use all through the CVs is a nice way of showing, even if you have a logo, a company logo that is full of color, try to use the different hues of uh, the, the grays or the, the blues pushing to the gray to use as a, a base color and just use a stronger color to highlight really what you, you need to highlight on the analysis. So yeah, it's perfect. Thank you, Nisa. So, and with that, we fin finalize our uh, panel. We don't have any questions. We will be sharing the, the links. So we will send the email with the links of the visualizations that we showcased today. Please go to Tableau Public. You can download many of those works that we, we showcased and uh, you can use. Of course, don't forget to, to give credit to the authors. But uh, yes, just reverse engineer because that is the way of learning. And now for the most uh, awaited part is the chocolate cocktail for sure with Where Annabelle. Where is Annabelle? Where is Annabelle? Annabelle she where just are ran you? away from us. <laughs> <laughs> so Annabelle. Yes, I'm here. Perfect. Here we go. <laughs> Tell us how to how to make the chocolate. <laughs> so first things uh, I wanted to go back with the ingredient that you need. So first you have to have very good quality chocolate. That is a secret. <laughs> if you don't have good quality chocolate, your chocolate will not be as good as it can be. So here you have different type of chocolate, but any chocolate for uh, cooking will be good. Something else that I wanted to say is that if you want to do some whipping cream, you can do it homemade, you have different uh, ingredients, always take good quality, especially for this baby, because there is a lot of accident. So, uh, but you don't have to invest on that, like something happy like that makes the tricks. How to do that? Because a lot of people say, hey, I cannot do whipping cream, it's not so, yeah. The secret is you put these little babies in the fridge for two or three hours before doing the, chan the chantilly, it's called in French, but repeat cream in uh, English. And now I have it ready for later. So you will see the recipe is very easy. Now, you see, I have my chocolate ready. I have this, this little ingredient. I have my warm milk. And the trick is like do it in several times. Sorry for the noise. <laughs> so obviously, more chocolate you want, and better it is. But <laughs> we can after do like some uh, Strava peloton uh, sport to <laughs> eliminate the calorie. So. Let's see if I don't make any uh, mistakes. So here my chocolate is already well melted. And what I really like is to use some tonka bean because I think it's quite good with uh, chocolate. Uh, you can put, also put cinnamon on it. Et voila. Now, 
because I like to have some tableau glass. Let's see if that's a delicate part, girls. Let's see if I don't rinse <laughs> napkin. Okay. So my little plate. Definitely, I will uh, do the dishes later. And then the final touch, my whipped cream. I think that next time someone can uh, join me to my place <laughs> for the recipe, I think it will be like a nice. Uh, and after you can obviously on the whipped cream, put on some cacao if you would like. But yeah, decide for this year because it's a nice, have a nice marshmallow. <laughs> Enjoy. Love it. <laughs> Love the snowman, <laughs> for sure. I have just water here to drink. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> But I mean, we did all understand that Annabelle just invited us for hot chocolate to her place next year, right? So next Day of the Swim and Christmas event will be in Zurich. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that uh, done, um, let me introduce you to our second speaker of tonight. Um, so I'm more than happy to introduce you to Julia Büchting. Um, Julia originally is an artist, but after finishing her art studies, both in Munich and Mainz, she started looking for the next challenge and she found it in data visualization. Um, once she started using data visualization and creating data visualization, Julia instantly knew that she wanted to create graphs and build scatter plots for the rest of her life. Personally, I'm a big fan of scatter plots, so I'm definitely on board with that. Um, today, she works as a data artist, so right on the brink between art and data analytics, really great, and she's full of passion for all things data and visuals, which she will be sharing with us today. Due to this career change, Julia brings a unique perspective to dashboards and to working in the IT sector, and I'm really interested in hearing what she has to tell us about that. So, Julia, over to you. Thanks, Heidi, for the warm introductory words. I'm super excited to be here today. So let me just get started with my uh, presentation. OK, so here we go. Um, from building sculptures to building dashboards, how I changed career from art to data art. So just a small spoiler ahead. I didn't do it on my own. It was a great team effort and very challenging. So to top it off and just to make myself more common as well, just write in the chat that when you finished school, what did you think you would become? Like, what did you think your job would going to be? And what is your job now? So I'm really curious to see Am I the only one who has such like a crooked um, life uh, line? So um, this is what I thought my art would look like. So I thought I would do like some kind of beautiful painting and kind of sunsets and like everybody would, would just like it. But then my art ended up looking like this. And you can see a room here. And really all I did was paint the floor white and install that lighting on the top. And uh, it was really conceptual. It, had, it was even a little bit performative. And it's impossible to sell and no way to make money out of it. So I imagined my life as an artist would look like this. This is Louise, uh, Louise Bourgeois, um, a world famous artist that I love very much. And I, would, I thought I would just, you know, sit there, make art all day, be creative. But it really looked more like this, or like my prospects were like this. So just hustling, having a job, doing art in my spare time, not even sure of any success, right? There's no jobs that just pay you to do your own creative stuff, right? 
So uh, the prospects were really dim. They were really uh, um, bad looking. And this is the only person I've known in over eight years of studying art who actually makes a living off of art. So she has no side hustle, uh, but she paints all day and she can actually support herself through her work three years after she graduated. So in these three years, um, she worked like all kinds of jobs, right? So what you can see here, she's a painter and you can hang her stuff in your living room. So that's a big asset if you wanna be, if you wanna make some money off your art, right? So I thought about like alternatives. I studied Turkish language because I was really good at languages. And then I wanted some, to study something that would give me a really nice, safe, secure job. So I studied social work also because, you know, everybody told me like, you're so good with people. You're great with children. Why uh, don't you become a teacher or a psychologist or a social worker? So yeah, yeah, I studied all these three things at once. And then I kind of looked took a look at the job market and um, I just looked at how much do the different occupations make and I realized I have chosen two of the three lowest paying jobs in the entire job market and I don't even like children that much so I was like okay come on you know what let's do it let's let's change careers let's do something really different and I started the big search, I call it like that, because it took me like over six months or even nine months. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna search for a really long time. I was really prepared uh, to search. Why? Because I thought, man, there are so many jobs out there that I don't even know. Like, uh, I, I just know like my own bubble and I really wanna find out what these jobs are. And also I somehow believe that there's the perfect job for me, I don't know what it is. I, I don't know what it's called like. I don't, know, I don't know where it is or I don't even know what I'm going to do. I just know it's there. So just imagine that you're really hungry and you're looking for the perfect meal. So you enter the supermarket and you go like, oh, my perfect meal is here, but you know, I don't know what I have to buy for it. And I, I don't know which aisle I'm, I have to go to. So uh, I was just really overwhelmed. And what I did is I went to a lot of like these kind of um, events where you can meet uh, different companies and uh, inform yourself about different jobs. So while I was there, I got to know this company called Woodmark Consulting. It's an IT consulting firm. And they did something with Tableau and I kind of like, oh yeah, visualizing, hmm, that sounds kind of good. I'm a visual person. And uh, so I went up to their recruiter and I was like, hi, I'm Julia. I'm an artist. Do you have a job for me? And uh, the recruiter was really surprised. Um, but then he went like, yeah, you know, we're, we're looking for a data artist actually. And he handed me a flyer. I thought to myself, okay, artist, yeah, got that. Data, not so much. So I went back to my hotel room and um, I Googled it and I found Tableau and Tableau Public. And the, seriously, within five minutes, I was like, bam, wow, that's my dream job. I'm gonna be a data visualizer. And, and I, I found it like, wow, my search really paid off. And I love that DataViz is creative, that it's technical, that I have to learn all this about data. And um, I love that it's so agile, it's, it's young, it's really global, it's cool. I just, I loved everything about it from the first day onwards. I loved data literacy, thinking about like, how can we improve people's ability to understand data visualizations and, and understand how data is aggregated. I loved, uh, I loved designing um, the design aspects like layout, how do, you, how do I place things where. I love the aspect of data communication that it actually everything adds up to communicating, not, not 
looking pretty. You know, art is also not about something looking good, right? Art is also about communication and interaction. So I found that in DataViz and, and I love the community, how connected everybody is and uh, yeah, that you have such a global network. So I'm showing you my first ever Viz. It's also on Tableau Public and um, what you can see is I took a Makeover Monday data and it's about the Tate collection. The Tate is a modern art museum in London. And I combined the th two things that I love the most, data viz and art. And I just made an exploratory viz of uh, the female artists in the collection because there's so few, there's much fewer female artists and uh, so much fewer fem artworks by um, females. So I really wanted to give um, people the uh, chance to explore their work, not to compare them with men, but to really get to know these artists. So already I discovered storytelling with data. That was like the first book I ever read, storytelling with data. And um, that's been a um, huge um, influence on me. So you wonder like, okay, then she's an artist, walks into an IT office. How does that work? Well, I did a, like a three months crash course in all things data and IT. So these are my colleagues and some of my teachers. And um, yeah, and uh, so that's what I felt like three, during the three months. And that's what I looked like. And it was just so much. I was so confused all the time. I had to learn everything from scratch. I thought SQL sounded like a complicated kitchen appliance. And suddenly I had to learn it. Uh, I learned how to join data and, and how, yeah, I learned Tableau, of course. I learned what's a server. You can't imagine, I, I had no touch points with, uh, with IT, but you know, uh, that recruiter, um, I didn't even have to write an application. I just gave him my CV and I said, like, I'm down. I'm your, I'm your guy. I'm your girl. And um, I had to fight tooth and nail um, for my company Woodmark to accept me. Like I had two rounds. Everybody else had one. And I was just so passionate about, about data viz. And I was inventing visas that in hindsight don't make any sense at all. But, you know, I was just giving it my all and saying like how much I want this and that my motivation to do data viz is enough to really get me started in IT. Um, plus I had a huge culture shock. Like imagine you're like in the art world and you're on top of like gender debate, critical whiteness, um, sex positivity, and everybody is just really woke. You have a huge diversity. People are so individualistic. Um, people are so, uh, yeah, some are really normal. Some are really cliche, crazy artists. Uh, uh, yeah, and then you go to the IT sector. Need I say more? Well, it was really male dominated. I went from reading about sexism to actually getting that creepy comment in my email inbox after a workshop and many other things. People are more steady, subtle. They tend to blend in a lot more, but I felt immediately um, good. I like, I found, I have so many nice colleagues and they were so accepting and, um, and understanding and uh, helpful. So how did I get through this, these first three months, this first um, culture shock? I used a lot of humor. I'm not known for being a very serious person and I have a very active imagination. So when people were talking about random fuzzy forests, uh, which is an algorithm. So this came to my mind. I was like immediately thinking of a forest that's really unfocused, and like a random lady standing there not knowing how she got here. Or people were talking about uh, data models and blockchain. And I was like, yeah, here's Pete. He's a data model for blockchain. I did these on, um, on PowerPoint and, and my breaks. And when I just had to like laugh, <laughs> um, or really relax a bit. But I, um, I really made it there. So I, 
uh, created more complex visas. I started on projects. I started giving workshops um, and also giving speeches about things that were really close to my heart, like uh, colors in DataViz or a layout in DataViz. I um, actually wrote a blog article uh, for my company about um, about what to consider when when doing a layout like following the um, line um, the, your reading direction and following the eye movement and um, much else uh, i also did like explanatory videos of the tableau products right so tableau explained in 100 seconds um, uh, so you can watch these on the website uh, and i bought like every data viz book uh, i ever read about um, so in two years these are my actual books i collected all of these in two years and still to this day if um, i just hear a data viz book mention i have to buy it i'm a huge book fan and uh, you can see like data feminism that i mentioned earlier uh, dear data storytelling with data which was was my very very first book that i bought so I draw a lot of from the community. So the Flailash twins, of course, like everybody knows them, they're uh, super technical and um, super active in the Tableau community. So I used, um, I believe Kevin's uh, Sankey diagram and I had a question about it because I wanted to expand it from seven to, I don't know, eight different um, flow sections. And I, I opened a Tableau community thread and then I, um, wrote to him on LinkedIn if he could please solve this and tell me the table calculations to uh, to do a more to do one more and he just he just did it he just texted me back hey it's so cool that you're an artist and here I solved your problem and now it's there in the community for everybody to um yeah to rebuild so um Chantilly her aesthetic really impressed me designs for a non-designer I um yeah I have definitely taken inspiration from her. But also um, uh, aside, um, also um, outside of the Tableau community is Lisa Charlotte Muth. She's a really big role model for me. She's more into um, uh, journalism and uh, she does amazing blog articles about um, uh, storytelling. But probably most important were my colleagues, Patricia and Nico, um, that were just really there for me and I could always call them and we would sometimes just chat for hours while doing our work separately. So I remember it was my first Christmas party at my company. I had like a good dress and I managed within five minutes of getting my food to like pour food down my dress. And I had like, oh good sauce all over my boobs. So I went to the bathroom and I was just, hoping nobody would see me washing this out, letting it dry. And uh, Patricia came up to me and she was like, hey, it's so great to have somebody else in the company that uh, didn't study um, IT or engineering, or she studied uh, German language um, and literature. And wow, I just felt immediately at home that somebody else would have like kind of a career change background and I connected with her. And um, it's just lovely to have them as colleagues. And they were also present at my wedding this summer. You can see um, my husband and me and some other colleagues. And uh, it's just lovely to be able to say, hey, I had uh, people from work at my wedding because yeah, they're just awesome. So a lot of times I didn't feel confident, uh, m much more like an imposter or maybe like a dog uh, in front of a screen, wondering like other people studied IT for eight years and I have done it for like two, what can I bring to the table? But I really just focused on my passions and uh, that kind of propelled me into just doing the things I'm passionate about and then also getting my competence uh, from, from that, from having a background in art. So I never see it as a manco. I um, always value it highly for what I learned. I, God, like I studied art, I learned project management. Like as an artist, you really need that. And nobody thinks about uh, project management when you think about artists. So 
one of my main missions is to make the world easier for other career changers. So in this, uh, in this comic strip, you can see like the Santa Claus saying career changers. Did you say career changers? Yeah, boss, but they're really putting in an effort. I can relate to that so much. Like I probably always gave 120%. And in the first few months, every time I got a letter from my company, I was like, oh, they're gonna fire me um, because I thought they finally say, okay, no, that was a weird experiment, but no, here I am two years later, really well integrated. Um, but I, I do want to um, coach people and um, make it cool for them to transition into IT because I believe we need people in IT with different educational backgrounds. So um, I do a lot of um, work in my free time. Uh, in German, it's called Ehrenamt. I don't know it in English. So I'm a mentor at Coffee Code Break. That's in the bottom left corner. Um, just please visit the website. It's mentoring from uh, women for women in tech. It's really easy to book a mentoring session. I love it. It's so easy to just call somebody um, and uh, chat for an hour. I'm also a really big fan of Data Plus Women, um, uh, especially in Germany. Um, I'm always uh, listening to the events. I'm a regular speaker at the Tableau User Group Germany. And uh, I'm also doing a few projects with some other German um, initiatives that are around getting young people into tech and into IT. But basically I am, and I believe I always will make art and be very passionate about it. I have an own room in my flat where I just have my art equipment and that's where I go to be happy. Here you can see me at an exhibition that I had this summer together with my colleague. Um, and it's so much nicer to just do art without having to make a living off of it. And also to have found something that I'm so passionate about making a living off of. Um, so I count myself uh, very happy and very blessed. So if you wanna get in touch, please um, find me on LinkedIn or find me on Coffee Code Break. Um, where you can book a mentoring session. Also, I have a Tableau public profile and um, I do post my art on Instagram. Uh, so yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. And hope you, um, hope you enjoyed it and let's get in touch. Well, thank you so much for sharing your journey and your experiences, Julia. We do have, in fact, a couple of questions. So one question we have is, how did you approach your search for a completely different professional direction? I was super open-minded. Like I would look at things that I would never have looked at. Um, and I just said yes to everything. And also went to interviews for jobs I never would have accepted just to get practice. And I talked to everybody about job search and, um, and I was just open. I was just not thinking about what I want to do, what I don't want to do. I was just saying yes to everything. And, and I knew it would take time. So I knew I had like six months or so to do this search. So I wouldn't have to be really like uh, pressed to find something tomorrow because I knew it would take time. So we in the data industry can be happy that not some other industry snapped you up first and said yes <laughs> to you. <laughs> no, in hindsight, it was meant to be, in hindsight. Okay. Um, do you feel that uh, interdisciplinary data professionals like you yourself are adequately appreciated? By whom is the question? I believe that sometimes um, we... Well, I believe that now two years later in my company, I'm appreciated for sure. Uh, but um, especially clients sometimes really frown at my art background. And I've also had like people or projects turn me down because of my art background. So um, yeah, um, well, I, I believe if they um, know me or know my work, then I am appreciated. But if you just, you know, look, wrongly look at the CV and don't see like, wow, she studied art, but now she works in the IT. She must be really good. But instead say, oh no, she has like the wrong background. Well, so it depends. 
did you have experiences where like colleagues or clients or people you worked with from an interdisciplinary background brought like unique values to your collaboration? For sure. I realized that um, people who studied other subjects often are more like down to the, especially to the discussions all around gender, society, equality, diversity. Like I feel like if people only study economics or IT or engineering, then they don't realize how, how also like the tone of conversations change or how you frame things differently or, or why you can be offended by certain things um, and how so I, I believe that social change is much closer to other subjects of, and areas of study. All right, great. Thank you so much. I think those were all the questions I could see at the glance. Um, Perfect. So I, I posted all my links that I mentioned in the talk in the chat. So fun with that. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, back to you. Well, I think that we're in time of uh, saying goodbye to everyone, right? We will just show before finishing. Let me just share my screen again because we have some meetings coming up. In reality, you note that apparently we have only one group, only Germany is the <laughs> already booked stuff for next year. The other groups were kind of uh, enjoying Christmas first or whatever we were doing. We're kind of uh, a little bit and we'll be back. So yeah, next event. Um, I think that Heide, you can also share in the- Yeah, do you want me to? <laughs> okay, yeah, so- uh, Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so we'll be kicking off the year on January 25th. So give you a couple of weeks to, to get over your uh, New Year's Eve parties. Um, and we will be talking about the mental load. We are hosting uh, Ruth Dreyer and we're happy to see you there. In February, um, relating to what Julia just talked about, we are hosting a couple of fantastic ladies from the Coffee Code Break community. Um, so definitely sign up for that if you want to figure out like what kind of value can you gain from being mentored, from mentoring others? How can you even find a mentor? Um, so definitely join us there. And on March, we're not quite set on the date, um, but we will most probably be hosting uh, Melissa Hill Dees, and she will be talking about Am I on Mute, um, talking about the um, the experience of being ignored as a woman, in especially in a male-dominated industry. Perfect. And thanks. Um, so those are the ones that are already booked. Um, for everyone following the, uh, our event today, we shared before the links for the hubs uh, for each city slash country. You can also follow by there and discover when you have an event close by. Well, close by nowadays is kind of a, not possible, right? It's more like a, virtually but you can follow also by the groups and discover when when the next event is coming up um and that said i'd like to say thanks to everyone um i think that it was amazing uh to have you all here uh to have our speakers uh our organizers and i hope to see you all next year too so thanks everyone and have a nice end of year and see you all in 2022. Bye-bye. Bye. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Bye. Bye.